I was just worried. He said, I did a call. He got so loose.
turn the Don's mic down. Hot mic, hot mic. Support
spring. Couldn't help but write about spring. Yesterday was a pretty day we had since last year. And I personally am glad winter is gone. But spring, how do we think about spring when our calendar reaches this date? It was such a beautiful weekend, cool, not cold breezes, warm sunshine instead of our cold, cloudy days. Most of us think, open the windows, let in the sunshine, refresh the air in our homes, clean out the winter in our lives, the sweaters, the blankets, etc. Some people even choose not to go to church on that first Sunday, just to take advantage of the beautiful weekend. But most of us think, clean, refresh, and renew. So I ask you today, on this spring weekend, to take a look at how you think about your meditation with Jesus before you meet him at his table. Clean, refresh, and renew how we commune with Christ. Each of us is offered a small wafer depicting the body of Christ. We are offered a small drink of juice depicting the blood of Christ. You automatically just take them as they're passed and hurry on to the next person. Do you see them as just the wafer and the juice? Do you actually see Jesus sitting at the table with you? Do you break bread with him, and do you drink with him? Think about this and some of the other times that we're offered small morsels or small portions. When you're offered in the kitchen a taste of what is being prepared, you're offered a small taste of what is to come. So when you take your communion emblems, you may see yourself sitting at the table with Jesus at a great feast in heaven, the feast yet to come. Sometimes you're offered a small portion of what is left, like leftovers. So you are being offered a small taste of what was a great feast, was a remembrance of what took place at that last supper. So let's ask ourselves, Am I taking this communion with the excitement and the commitment that I took my first communion after I accepted <coughs> Jesus as my Lord and Savior and following him in believer's baptism? Or am I taking this communion with the anticipation of meeting Jesus face to face as if this were my last communion on earth before going home to meet him? <coughs> Think about these things as our worship team offers us a song for communion. Ask yourself if spring needs to bring a renewal of your communion with Jesus. Do you need to renew your relationship with Jesus or begin one today if you haven't already? Help me know this 
Draw me close to you. Never let me go.
Oh, kids go to class? Okay. Yeah, children, sure, sure. Sorry? <laughs> See how well he communicates with me? Yeah. They know what to do. They, they know what to do. Okay. That's why your roommate's going to That's right. That's why we last the semester together. Hey, Larry. <coughs> Careful. Uh, well, we're going to talk this morning about doing things God's way. And we're going to talk in particular about his money. You know, when we get in church, we start talking about doing things God's way. We talk about faith. We talk about grace. We talk about how we treat our neighbors. We talk about spiritual things. But folks, I'm a very practical guy. And I like to teach practical things. And one of the things that I think we miss out on is teaching on the practicality of money. And please hear me. We're going to look at a lot of scriptures this morning and see a lot of ways. Jesus talked more about money when he was teaching in the Gospels on any other topic except one. He talked more about love than money. But that was it. And that just amazed me when I found that out. So this morning, because of where we are in our society and our culture, I just thought, we need some encouragement, folks. Because what we look at around us is not that good. And we need to know what God says that we need to do with His money. So we're going to talk about doing life God's way. Do you remember a few years ago, the bracelets that were out that had WWJD on them. What did that stand for? What would Jesus do? Well, I'm going to look around here this morning, and I'm going to grant to say that most of you sitting here this morning know what Jesus would do. So I would suggest that we need a new bracelet. And that new bracelet is W-I-D-I. -I. Will I do it? It's not a matter of whether we know what to do or not. It's a matter of whether we're willing to do it. And so we need to understand that even as we talk about doing things God's way with His money, it's a matter of whether or not I'm willing to do it. <coughs> See, I believe that churches for many, many years have taught something to people they should never have taught. Now, don't stone me here, especially from the preacher side. I don't think we should have taught the tithe. I don't think we should taught the giving only. Because what has happened for so many people in the church, we have taught all about the 10% that we need to give, all about the tithe that needs to come into the church. Well, if I've taught about that 10% what you give to the church, what happens to the 90%? That's mine. I can do with that what I want, right? That's what we've taught. But that is not right. I want you to hear me this morning. God owns it all. It's not ours. God is concerned as much today about what you go when you leave here and what you spend on lunch as He is about what you just put in the offering plate. Because it's all His. So God is concerned about how we do life with His money. Doing life, or uh, do life God's way with His money. We're going to talk about five areas this morning about how we need to deal with life. We're going to look and see, first of all, what the world says. There's a pull in the culture out there that's leading us one way. And you know something? That is pretty much just the opposite of where God's leading. Isn't that how it is with most things in life? We think one way in the church and the world's thinking something else. And we're going to see that in particular this morning as we talk about money. We're going to talk about, we're going to see what God says about, first of all, earning money. Then we're going to see what God says about giving money. Then we're going to see what God says about saving money. Then we're going to see what God says about debt. And then we're going to see what God says about spending. Those are the five areas of money. We earn it, and then there's four things we can do with it. There's nothing else we can do with it. That's it. And so God has something to say about each and every one of those. And in the church, we spend all our time, I won't say that, in the church, we spend much of our time disappearing on giving. That's right. I'm going to my mind over there. But we're going to talk about that this morning. The first thing we need to understand, there are three myths out there in the world. Three myths that are just engulfing us. Number one, the first myth that we see is things bring happiness. Things bring happiness. Have you ever seen a commercial on TV where they're trying to sell you a car and all frowning? <laughs> Doesn't happen, does it? They want us to understand if we buy that car, we'll be the happiest people on earth. 
If we get that house, then we're going to be happy. If we get that sweater, we're going to be happy. If we get those clothes, we're going to be happy. The world is teaching us that things bring happiness. The second myth that's out in the world is that debt is expected and unavoidable. Debt is expected and unavoidable. How many of you have got in your mail this week one of those little flyers that says you can have this credit card with this limit? How many of you got just one? Just one? You're good. Uh, no, one a day. Oh, one a day. <laughs> and that's how it is, folks. That's what the world expects, expects us. And before we hit this crisis and all these banks had all this trouble and, and they been bailed out, before that time, there was one week I kept every one of them because I started to do this message. I kept every one of them. I had 47. 47 applications for credit cards because the world's trying to teach us that we need to live in debt. So it's expected and unavoidable. The third myth is that a little more money will solve all of our problems. A little more money will solve all of our problems. That's a myth. Have you ever seen the show it's on TV? I think it's on Discovery Channel about um, the lottery winners and how the lottery changed my life, I think is the name of the show. <laughs> I watched that the other night. I was blown away. They win millions of dollars. And within five to six years, guess what? They have nothing. It didn't solve any of the problems. And it wasn't a little more money. It was a lot of money. But they're right back where they were, or worse. In most cases, they were worse off than they were before. You see, the thing with that money, I have a theory. And that theory is that money takes down the barriers and the boundaries and allows us to be who we truly are. Think about that for a moment. Money takes down the boundaries and the barriers to allow us to be true, who we truly are. And that might be scary for some. And we see it with those lottery winners, what happens when they win. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, where your heart is, or excuse me, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Notice he didn't say where your heart is, your treasure will be. Do you notice that? He knew that our heart's going to follow our money. Our money doesn't follow our heart. It's the other way around. So every decision, every financial decision that we make is a spiritual decision. Do you ever think about that? Every financial decision we make is a spiritual decision. So we need to understand that none of what we have is ours. Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, there was nothing. And God created. If He created it, He owns it. It's His. Everything that is here is His. And we need to understand that. We are not the owner. God owns everything. God owns everything. If God owns it, and He's given something to me that I'm a trustee. I'm a steward. I need to take care of what God has given me. Do you know what a trustee does? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2 says, Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. <coughs> What's the trustee do? Tracy <coughs> dies and leaves a trust, and I become the trustee of his trust. Can I do with that money that he left in there whatever I please? What happens if I do? I go to jail. I go to jail. I go on vacation to Hawaii because Tracy left some money for his kids' education. I go to Hawaii on that right? I'm in jail. We are to be proven faithful with the trust that we've been given. And folks, being in jail would be kind of nice compared to what might happen if we're not faithful got what God's given us. You see, when I get to heaven, I want to hear Jesus look at me and say, well done, good and faithful servant is what we say and what Scripture teaches. But I think there's another word that we can put in there. Well done, good and faithful steward. Did you take care of what I gave you? I can just see Jesus asking that question of me. Did you take care of what I gave you? 
So it's my responsibility to do with it what Jesus wants me to do, what God has directed me to do. So let's dig in and find the five areas in which God addresses about money. The first thing we need to understand is that we are to be diligent earners. <coughs> diligent earners. Secondly, we need to be generous givers. We'll dig into each one of these in a moment. Then we need to be wise savers. Wise savers. We need to be cautious debtors. Cautious debtors. And we need to be prudent consumers. Let's talk about the earning. Our culture tells us, and it's pulling at us, that our value is measured by position and paycheck. And the myth is it just takes a little more money to solve all of our problems. That ties right into that. <clears throat> it tells us that we are what we make. But yet the Bible says, and God says, His heart is that our value is not measured by what we do, but by who we are. And better yet, by whose we are. We're His children. We're called to join Him in the ongoing management of His creation. He also tells us, He also tells us that work is a blessing and not a curse. Did anybody hear that one? I feel that way now. Early on, I didn't. We think back, well, it's a curse because when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, Adam was told he was going to toil but the sweat of his brow. That's a curse. Uh, question. Wasn't he toiling in the garden and managing the garden before? Work is going to be a blessing, not a curse. And the attitude with which we do that makes a great difference. We are to uh, earn with uh, commitment, purpose, and a grateful attitude. A diligent earner is one who's committed, has a purpose, and a grateful attitude. Colossians 3.23. Colossians 3.23 tells us to be committed. It says, whatever you do, work out with all your heart. As working for the Lord and not for men. Work out with all your heart. In the 80 hours I spend in the office, do I work out with all my heart? challenge myself. We also need to be purposeful. We need to think, not only do we need to work as though we're working for the Lord rather than men, which Colossians 3.23 says, but 1 Timothy 5.8 says, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And I love the old King James here. It says, he's worse than an infidel because we don't care for our arm. That is what we're supposed to do. That is why we earn, is to take care of those. And we're to be diligent. We're to be committed. We're to have a purpose. And it has to do with a grateful attitude. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 17 and 18, reminds us that even our ability to earn comes from God. And we had this discussion a little bit in Sunday school class this morning. It says, you may say to yourself, my power, my strength, and my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. So we make money. But what do we do with it? What do we do with it? The first thing we're going to look at is that we give it. Here's what the culture teaches about giving. The culture teaches us, and it pulls at us all the time, that we give if it benefits us. You see that? It, give if it's been, and even, please understand, even the ministries that we work with, and, and, and some of the uh, ministries that I see on TV, and, and one that I love very dearly and support is focused on the family. But even they, if you give a donation, what do they do? They give you something that benefits you, don't they? They give you a book. They give you a tape. They will give you something that benefits you. And that's what the world's teaching. Give if it benefits you. The second thing that the world teaches is that give if you have something left over. If there's something left, then give. But the last thing that the world teaches is that you give because of a sense of duty. I owe it to you. That's what the world teaches. But God calls us to be a generous giver. We need to have a giving lifestyle. We need to give with obedience of the will. We need to give with a joyful attitude. And we need to give with a compassionate heart. 
You see, we were created to give. We were created in God's image. Think about that. Back in Genesis, we're creating God's image. And then I go to John 3.16. For God so loved the world, He gave. For God so loved the world, He gave. And He gave, and He gave, and He gave, and He gave. Folks, we're creating that image. We are to be generous. I have a minister friend of mine, a rather elderly minister friend, that uh, we were at a conference one time, and they were trying to take up an offering to help pay for the conference. He asked everyone to stand up. He says, now reach in the pocket in front of you and grab the billfold of the person in front of you. And then give like you've always wanted to give. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, it, it's funny, and we laugh at that. But because it's not ours, it's easy to give. See, again, it's back to who owns it. For me to write a check on Sunday morning and to give it should be freely, generous. It should be cheerful, as Scripture says. And if you look at the root of that word, it's to give hilariously. When's the last time you just laid your check in the offering place? When's the last time you laid one in and just started busting and got laughing? <laughs> the funniest man I've ever, uh, that I've ever uh, had the privilege of sitting in front of and to watch is Bill Cosby. I laughed until my sides hurt. He's sitting on a chair. No props, no nothing. He's just sitting on his chair telling the story. And I'm laughing hilariously. That's what it should be like. That's what my heart should feel like when I give to God. It should be that kind of giving. That's what cheerful means. We are to give in that way. We are to give of uh, God's goodness. And the reason we do that is so that our focus stays on Him as our security. Wall Street's not our security. God is our security. And He wants us to see that. Matthew 6 says, Those are uh, treasures here on earth where they will be eaten by moths and they get rusty. Where thieves break in and they steal. Store your treasures in heaven. He wants us to remember who supplies our needs. He also wants us to give to bless others. Have you ever had the opportunity where you could give to someone and you felt like if it was something you could bless them and in return, who was more blessed? I just had that opportunity. I have a friend very dear friend in Finley, Ohio. His daughter of 17, she was 17 years old. She was going to Ohio State on a scholarship for track. Found cancer. In three months, she was gone. He lost his daughter. I get a phone call. This is 17 months ago. I get a call uh, three weeks ago. His wife has ALS. <coughs> and we expect her to live until April. He's got eight children. He was telling me the story that he couldn't get his son's birthday present out of uh, a layaway uh, that he wanted to give him for his birthday because he couldn't afford to because they just lost their house. And so I wrote a check and I sent it to him to get those boots for the son for his birthday. Something I thought, I, I can bless him. That would be great. That would be awesome. But I sent that check one day and the next day somebody blessed me. Not in the same way. Please understand. Not financially. But the blessing came back to me much stronger than what I sent out. Folks, that's how God works. You cannot outgive God. There is no way we can do that. So He wants us to give to bless others. But the biggest reason I think God wants us to give is so that we break the hold that money has on us. So we understand our dependency on God and not on the money. So that's giving. We need to be generous givers. Then we need to be savers. We need to be wise savers. Culture tells us, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you die. Doesn't it? Spend what you have. And if you don't have it, spend it anyway. Right? That's what they tell us. Do it. Spend it now. Get these things. Buy it all. Spend it because it's going to go. You know, I know people who make $25,000 a year. They spend $25,000 a year. I know people who make $50,000 a year. Guess what? They spend fifty thousand a year. I've got a first five hundred thousand dollars a year. Guess what he spends? Five hundred thousand dollars a year. We spend what we have. That's the mindset of the culture. That's the pull that we face. They want us to spend what we have, and so we got to be careful with that. It's beautiful to save because you can't take it with you, and I, I believe that we can't take it with us. When's the last time you saw a hearse pull into U-Haul? Don't have. 
happened to us that we can't take it with us. But that doesn't mean we spend it <laughs> either. So we need to keep that in mind. In 2006, there were 1.2 million mortgage foreclosures. That's 2006. I've been trying to find the numbers for the last two years, and I haven't been able to locate them yet. 1.2 in 2006, that was up 40% from 2005. There were 5.3 million bankruptcies in 2006. Folks, that means we're standing at the edge. We're looking down. There's no cushion. There's no savings here to keep us from going over the edge. And that's how most of us live. In the same year, 2006, 72% of people 65 years of age and older had less than $2,000 in a savings account. That blows my mind. But it's because we live at the edge. We spend what we get. And that's what the world teaches. But God's called us to be wise savers. Ones who build, preserves, and invest with discernment. God says it's wise to save. Wise to save. Proverbs 21 20 says, In the house of the wise, <clears throat> excuse me, in the house of the wise are stores of choice food and love, but the foolish man devours all he has. It's wise to save. But hear me, it's foolish to hoard. We know the parable in Luke chapter 12, and that's we've got to find that balance because Luke 12 tells the, the farmer that built the, tore down the barns and built the new ones. What happened? The Lord said, You fool. Tonight your soul is going to be taken from you. So what's that balance? How do we determine what to say and what to and to be sure that we're not wrong? To me, it, it, it's fairly simple. Saving is future spending. Everything of it that way? Saving is future spending. I'm saving to put a new roof on the house. I'm saving to buy a new car. I'm saving for this. I'm saving for that. It is future spending. Hoarding is once we reach those goals, we continue to save and to save and to save. I counseled with a family one time that had 22 savings accounts. I don't think they're called savings accounts. I think those are 22 hoarding accounts. Because you've got goals and you've met those goals, then it's time to see what God wants you to do. Each one of us have to answer for ourselves when is enough enough. And we see that. So we need to understand that savings is important and it's wise. We put it away for the right goals. So savings, we keep money. You know the other thing that our, our world's teaching us, I forgot to mention this, the other thing the world teaches us about saving. Their idea of saving is just not spending. Have you noticed on the store, I and mean, Kohl's is good for this, and Kohl's is a place I shop a lot. But Kohl's has this ticket when I get out and I look and see what I bought. It tells me how much I saved on the bottom. <laughs> right? You know what it says? You saved X number of dollars in such a percentage. And I just, my wife, my wife is very good at that. She said, look what I saved you. <laughs> Let's have a conversation there. Give me an example. You get a sweater for twenty dollars, it's twenty-five percent off. How much does it do you save? Nothing. Hmm? Nothing. nothing. <laughs> we don't save nothing because we spend fifteen. Do you understand that concept? But the world's teaching us that means savings. No savings is something that's still in my pocket. Not something that went out and they didn't think they it just didn't cost as much. Let's talk about the priorities that the culture has for us. The cultures the priorities of the culture is the first thing we need to be concerned about is lifestyle. The first thing we need to be concerned about is lifestyle. Where I live, what I drive, what I wear. Those are the things the culture tells us that we need to be concerned with first. The second thing the culture says that we need to spend our money on is debt. Why? Because we can't afford to do this. We live in houses we can't afford. We buy cars we can't afford. We go into debt. So now we have to take care of the debt. So we're living a lifestyle we can't afford, we got the debt, we got to pay the debt. So those are the first two things the culture tells us to use our money on. The second, the third thing is savings. If you have anything left after you do those things, then save some. And lastly, the culture will say, if there's anything left and you feel obligated, if you've got this duty that you have to fulfill, then you give. That's how the culture sees it. Let's look at what God says. God is pretty much opposite of the world, right? So the first priority in God's list is giving. The first thing God wants us to do is to give. The second thing God wants us to do is save. It's to 
the same. And then, just, you know, you take care of your lifestyle. Okay, how decide that uh, giving, saving, your lifestyle? Put 10, 10, 80. 10, 10, 80. <coughs> what would I do that? Well, I, first of all, I pay God 10%. Then I pay myself 10%. And then I live on 80%. That's God's formula. It's been around for years. I've been teaching that for years. And about five years ago, a gentleman came to me, the friend of Penley, and said, I don't think that's right. I said, well, why not? He said, well, I think it ought to be 10, 10, 30, 50. 10, 10, 30, 50. Yeah, pay God 10%. Pay yourself 10%. Pay Uncle Sam 30%. Live on 50%. If I were to ask you today to start to live on 50% of your income, could you do it? I can't. I, I stand in front of you ashamed and say, I can't do that. That's my goal. But because before I understood all of this, I got myself in a world of a hurt. And I can't do that yet. But that's where I want to be. I want to be able to be like Rick Warren. Have you heard the story of Rick Warren? Uh, Pastor Saddleback Community Church out in, in uh, <coughs> California, where he now reverse ties. He gives 90% and lives on 10%. Wouldn't that be nice to be able to do that? Let's talk about something here. What's missing in God's plan? Debt. Debt. There is no debt. <coughs> If we live the way that God wants us to live, there is no debt. Debt, the culture says, is expected and unavoidable. God says that we need to be cautious debtors. We need to avoid entering into debt. That we need to be careful and strategic when incurring debt. And most of all, we need to always, always repay debt. I have a couple acronyms for debt that I really like. Number one, debt is the dumb explanation for buying things. Think about that. Dumb, debt is a dumb explanation for buying things. If I've got to go to the golden plastic calf to buy something, do I really need it? If I don't have the money to get it, do I really need it? The other thing to consider with, uh, with debt, if you think of that uh, acronym, is don't even buy that. Don't even buy that. If we can't pay for it, why do we do that? Because our culture has told us that we can do that and we can pay for it in the future. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. Deuteronomy chapter 28, beginning verse 12, we find these words. The Lord will open the heavens of the storehouse of His bounty to send rain on your own. Uh, to send rain on your land in season and bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. Think about that for a moment. You will lend to many nations, you will borrow from none. When's the last time the church got together here and lent somebody some money? <coughs> we give it to help people out, right? But there's banks on every corner in this town that take care of that town. But if we do things the way that God has said, we would be the ones people would be coming to. If we live the way He wants. Please understand, God is not saying that debt is a sin. God is not saying debt is wrong. He's saying if you live the way that I have commanded you to live, debt is not in your vocabulary. And you will be the lender and not the borrower. It's very clear to me that God does not want us in debt. He wants us to be lenders. God says, I want you to be free so you can lend to many and to borrow from none. Have you ever stopped to seriously consider what it would be like not to have debt? No mortgage, no car payment, no credit card payments. What would it be like if the next time your paycheck came, whether it's monthly, weekly, bi-weekly, whatever, the next time it came, there was no pre-obligation to it. When that check came, no matter what it was, you could do with it whatever you wanted. I just saw some smiles on some faces. Doesn't that feel good just to think about that? What that would be like? Well, I could do them what I wanted. Let me take it a step further. If every one of us in this room this morning were debt-free, 
And there was a local mission that came in here and had great need. And they came in and presented that need to you. They needed ten thousand dollars. If none of us in here were in debt, could we raise ten thousand dollars pretty easily for them? Oh, without bat an eye. My thing is, I, we'd probably raise uh, twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars. What would you do with the extra money? You'd bless them. That's the intent. If we live the way that God has called us to live, then our life would be spent blessing people because God has given to us. Do we understand this morning sitting here that because of our address that we are among the top 4% of the wealthiest people in the world? The top 4%. Think about that. The Bible says we need to be a cautious debtor. Let me give you some principles out of Scripture about the dangers of debt. Number one, going into debt makes you a servant to someone other than God. God does not want us to be in bondage to anyone. And yet, when we take out debt, we become bound to someone other than God. Second, clearly, it is a sin if you borrow and don't repay. It's not a debt, it's not a sin to borrow, but it's a sin to borrow and not repay. <coughs> Third Bible warns it's better not to go in debt. The longest term of debt that God's people took in the Bible? Seven years. Seven years. My brother just went and bought a car on 12 years. On a car? <coughs> He's also been bankrupt twice. You're not in control of your own future. This is why it's important if we understand this. Because when we go into debt, that means we think that we have the future to pay for. Did God come to any of you last night in a vision and say He promised you tomorrow? He promised you next week? We don't have that, do we? God has not promised us days on this earth. And yet, when we go to debt, our assumption is that we will have those. When you go to debt, you're making you're asking someone else other than God to get your needs. You depend on the golden calf of plastic to meet our needs. When you go into debt, you mortgage your future and affect your whole family. Please hear that. Uh, that is very, very real to me right now because my father-in-law was very, very poor at managing money, has mortgages on about nine different properties that he has his rental. And he is 74 years old and not able to do very well. And as a matter of fact, his health is deteriorating very quickly. Who's responsible for his mortgages? His wife. And then? Me. Because I married one of his daughters. Keep that in mind. We we'll place others in the boat with us when we do that. And lastly, we're going to be spending. We're going to be prudent spenders. Culture tells us things bring happiness. We're talking about that in Sunday school class today. Things bring happiness. Uh, shoes, I believe, was the topic in Sunday school class. Shoes can be, bring happiness to some people. That's what the world tells us. Our possessions define who we are, the more we have, the more we should spend. Spending becomes a competition. Shoes bring happiness. Okay, women, that's fine. I, I, I told him in class, I said, my wife is very good. My wife can go shopping 30 times to my one. And we'll just about balance out what we spend. Because the bigger the boy, the bigger the toy. It's golf clubs, it's cars, it's motorcycles, it's four-wheelers for me. For my wife, it's shoes, it's a dress, it's a sweater. There's a lot of difference, but it's still about the things. And the things bring happiness. Do they really? If you think things bring happiness, watch a two-year-old at Christmas. Aren't they great? Two, two and a half, you throw a present in front of them, what happens? <laughs> they look at that thing they got for about 10 seconds. And then two weeks later, what are they playing with? The toy that was in the box or the box? We need to learn from two-year-olds. Things aren't going to bring in happiness. It just doesn't happen. God says, 
as a prudent consumer is one who enjoys the fruits of his labor, yet guards against materialism. Folks, the God of this country that sits on the throne in place of